Okay, hi, I'm uh, Scott Jones. Again, I'm uh, uh, director of the Electronic Frontiers Forums track, this very track, and this is uh, activism at the State House, or uh, you know, basically state level activism. Um, go ahead. Uh, I'm Dave Moss. I am an investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which usually means I file a lot of FOIA requests, but it's been a very, very busy year at the legislature in California, so uh, that's what I have to talk about today. Okay, so who am I? I'm a developer with a lot of Unix system administration experience. Um, and I've got, you know, over 25 years in, in uh, software development. I'm a, a mem member of Electronic Frontiers Georgia, uh, and I'll be talking about that more in a minute, but we have, a, it, it was inactive for a while and we decided to restart it this year. Um, you know, I've been a, a fan of technology since boyhood. Uh, I was pretty much apolitical until the mid-90s when I got started with Electronic Frontiers Georgia. And most importantly for me, activism policy is a hobby. And uh, of course, Dave here will be talking about it as a career. <laughs> okay, so Electronic Frontiers Georgia. Uh, I think um, th this is a, a local activist group. It's um, uh, we, we operated a lot at the state level. Um, we were inspired um, by, elect by Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, EFF, but we were not officially a part of them. We were officially always, and, and still are, an independent organization. Um, our, I guess our high point was uh, that we uh, sued the state of Georgia um, along with the ACLU of Georgia uh, in, the, in the landmark case known as ACLU versus Miller. And this was to oppose a bill that at, it, at its broadest reading would have outlawed at the state level using pseudonyms on the internet. And that, was, that came out of a dispute on how, this, how, a, how a particular legislator was using the state seal. <coughs> and of course, instead of uh, regulating how the state seal was being used, they did something incredibly overbroad. And that, that's something you always have to look for. And if you, you know, read that law at, at its broadest reading, it made it, uh, it, it basically said that it was illegal to falsely identify yourself on the internet, which, which uh, you know, scopes in pseudonyms and things like that. So that was a great concern to us. Um, uh, also, we lobbied for the market-based approach to electronic commerce. The, the, the state was looking at adopting the Utah model, which would have put the state in charge of certif uh, you know, certification authorities or certific certificate authorities. And, uh, we lobbied against that, and we wanted to go with the uh, the market-based approach. Um, and something I personally worked on a lot was uh, opposition to what the so-called state DMCA's. They were cable industry laws with unreasonably harsh penalties. Um, and uh, you know, we basically came into committee and testified against it, and we were able to we were able to keep it from moving. Um, we were also opposed to a state-level bill that would make it illegal to film movies in theaters. Um, this basically looks like a copyright law, but it's being done at the state level, and copyright should really be at the federal level. Um, we did not catch this one in committee, and we were unsuccessful in stopping it. But this is really the, um, you know, don't film a movie with your iPhone law. Um, but it, it made it illegal to operate uh, a recording device of any kind while a movie was being played, regardless of whether you're recording the movie or not. So again, it was overbroad. Um, again, we've hosted several educational talks in Atlanta area, inside and outside of DragonCon. Uh, so this series of talks, but also talks locally. And we post those these days on meetup.com, so if you're interested, you can look for us on meetup.com. Uh, we, Electronic Frontiers Georgia became active, inactive around 2007, but we restarted this year with, with uh, the political concerns in the, in the past election. That, that kind of put some oomph behind uh, getting things started again. So what is activism? Uh, according to Wiktionary, uh, it's the practice of using action to achieve results such as a political demonstration or strike in support of or opposition to an issue. And uh, then we also talk about policy. Um, and this is my definition. Lawyers will tell you what the law is today and policy analysts will tell you what they think the law should be. Uh, the other thing that's not on this slide is we want to differentiate between policy and culture. Policy are, are things that you would pass laws about and culture a lot of times are things that would be inappropriate to legislate but you may use moral suasion to, to um, try to, to you know, encourage or discourage a particular action. And so I think a lot of times the activists may be focused on cultural issues 
and maybe should refocus their energy, their energy on uh, policy issues. So it's important to distinguish between the two. Um, and so these are five things. I'm going to go through them one by one. So activism, it doesn't have to involve getting arrested, breaking the law, or black hat uh, activism. Uh, we work. We try to work within the law. I think we have a, a great system in America, even if it feels like it's under threat at times. Uh, you know, the First Amendment and, and the framework that we have to work within our system is really what we try to use. Um, these are some of the great examples, you know, over time of activism. And sometimes there's a time and a place, you know, when you do need to go out and demonstrate. But we really try to work within the system and we try to work um, you know, at the, at the state capitol with le the legislators to get to achieve what we want to achieve. Um, state legislatures publish their bills online, obviously federal too. You may find even local local ordinances online. A lot of, uh, just a lot of stuff is online, so you need to get out there and look for that. Uh, if you're in Georgia, the site is legis.ga.gov. Um, but every state will have a different site, so you'll need, uh, Google is your friend here, you can look it up. Effective abs activism absolutely requires being away from keyboard or AFK. Um, it, you can do a lot from behind a keyboard, a lot of so-called point-and-click activism, but at some point you need to press the flesh. You need to get out and shake hands and meet your legislators and get them used to seeing you. So it's, it's important to do both. Um, and uh, you know, I don't want to don't want to imply that, that being point-and-click is bad, but it's really you're, you're not getting the whole picture if you're not if you're not doing uh, all parts of it. Um, the right place to fix or kill a bad bill is in committee. So committees go through this entire process. If you look, uh, you know, I mean, this is coming from our General Assembly where it says idea, drafting, introduction, first reading, second reading. It's this whole process. And if you're in software development, you look at this and you say, oh, this is a state transition diagram. Well, I've seen these before. But, um, you know, it's kind of the circles and arrows diagram. I don't have it diagrammed out, but it goes through this whole process. But the most important part of the process is the committee meeting. So once a bill leaves committee, it's very difficult to stop. You want to find out when the committee meeting is and try to get into that committee meeting and see if you can get on the schedule to testify. You may only have three, four, or five minutes that you can testify, but just to come out and say something uh, is very important. If four, five, six people show up to a committee meeting, a lot of times these committee meetings are pretty empty, but just a couple people, a handful of people who are obviously not lobbyists and obviously not related or coming from the same family or the same company to testify about a bill, that makes an impression on a state legislator a big time. Uh, it's, it, it can be a different scope and scale on the federal level, but these state legislators, a lot of times they don't see their constituents very much, and so it really makes a big deal when just a couple of people can come out and testify. Um, the other rule is don't burn politicians or others. They can be your allies in the future. You want to focus on the policy itself and not the legislator for the most part. Um, and today's enemy can be tomorrow's ally. And as an example of that, I told you about the bill we had enjoined uh, regarding the pseudonyms on the internet. We, we went in to testify about state DMCAs. Uh, the guy that was sitting on that committee was the guy who wrote the bill that we had enjoined. So if we had made it a, a personal matter and, and made it kind of vicious and bitter and personal, uh, we might not have prevailed on that issue. So you don't want to burn your bridges. Um, the exception here is maybe if a legislator is breaking the law or an ethics rule, a very clear breakage of an ethics rule, um, then maybe it becomes fair game, but I still think you have to weigh it a little bit. But in general, it's a bad idea to go after the person individually. You want to go for the policy. Um, you can find your state legislator at this great website called openstates.org. Um, you may find it through Google searches and other uh, means, but openstates.org will, will just kind of nail it down for you. Put in your address, and regardless of which state you're in, you'll find your state legislator um, right there. So that's very handy. You can also find the actual legislation itself there. Um, you can compare and contrast. I would tend to think that your own state's website is a little more up to date, but, um, but you can also track legislation itself through openstates.org. It's worth taking a look at. Um, here's my slide on, on personal networking, diversity, inclusion, um, and I'll talk about why I say these things. Um, it's a very good idea. Again, we, we ta I talked about away from keyboard. It's a very good idea to attend other events, get to know people, 
and kind of form those, those personal and professional relationships. Those are very important. Um, you're not going to be able to do everything you need to do by sending email and clicking on buttons. Uh, Meetup.com is a, is a very good site to find people um, that are interested in other causes that might be interested in your cause. So you may want to attend other groups that are not necessarily a bullseye target for your group and your goal, but they might be similar. For instance, um, you know, if you're talking about, uh, if your cause is a progressive cause, you might want to attend other progressive groups to see if you can get some, some interest and some maybe even cooperation or cross-listing between groups. So it's important to get out there. Um, the other thing I'm saying here, diversity isn't really diverse and inclusion isn't really inclusive unless a conservative point of view is included. And this sounds a little bit political, um, but the reason I say this is for Electronic Frontiers Georgia, the, uh, in the case of the Republican Party, there's a libertarian wing of the party and a status wing of the party. Um, and a lot of times the libertarian side of the party is interested in our point of view, whereas the status side may not be. So you might, you don't necessarily want to write off half the people who could support your cause or a quarter of the people that could support your cause because you identify as progressive or you identify as conservative. You want to be able to cross the aisle to some point and appeal to both sides. And I think you'll find allies on both sides if you try. So that's why I put this in here. I'm not trying to make an overt political statement here. And, and we don't necessarily want Electronic Frontiers Georgia to identify strongly as, as liberal or conservative because we want to be able to draw from both camps. We, we probably could find allies in both camps. We won't find allies 100% of the time, but it's just something to think about um, when, you're, when you're deciding you know, which groups to approach. Um, so some points to ponder about uh, the, and these circle back to activism. Is America truly a divisive place that it appears to be in today's political climate? Or, or are we intentionally uh, being divided up for the sake of another's profit in politics? And if we are being divided up for the sake of another's profits in politics, then courtesy, cooperation, consideration of the other side's point of view, and unity and even solidarity are revolutionary acts. So this is something to think about in today's caustic climate. Uh, it can be hard to operate as an activist in today's uh, charged political climate without getting branded um, as being on one side or the other, you know, red or blue, left or right, um, and being written off that way. So I think you want to exercise a little bit of care and realize that, that, that cooperation can be a wonderful thing in a time when um, everything seems to be so divisive. And so that's it for mine. Uh, we'll switch over to Dave's presentation here. And if you're interested in Electronic Frontiers Georgia, the website is ef-georgia.org. Thanks, Scott. Here we go. So my presentation is going to have a little overlap with uh, Scott's, but the good news is is that all the points are worth repeating over and over and over again. So we'll be good. Just a moment. Coming soon. Perfect. Uh, so once again, I'm Dave Moss, and I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, for you know the last year or so, I've been focusing mostly on California issues. Um, I love state houses. Uh, before I worked at EFF, I worked as a reporter, and I covered state houses in Arizona, in New Mexico, in Texas, in California, and I just love them. Um, but why? Why are they so great? Well, I personally think that Congress kind of sucks. Um, some people I work with may not feel the same way. Uh, things are very, very slow. You might have to deal with a piece of legislation for like a decade. Um, it's heavily, heavily partisan. They're frequently deadlocked and they can't get things through a filibuster. They spend so much time fundraising that it sometimes takes away from their uh, serving their constituents. The lobby you know, uh, ecosystem in, in DC is just, you know, uh, it's all about access donations. You know, uh, you know, lobbyists get a lot more access than everyone else does. Uh, there, a lot of them are obsessed with the media and being on the media and doing interviews and doing Sunday morning shows. Um, they are uh, 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 saturated with activism. Everybody's trying to get something to them, and they always end up getting, you know, a, a senator, a congressman, may end up hearing from you know a thousand people who are outside of their district, and it's hard to cut through the noise. And then they also spend a good chunk of the year far, far, far away from the places they represent. Um, I mean, I guess it's closer if you live on the East Coast, but for those of us on the West Coast, for those of us in the South, um, we may not see our legislators that often. 
So what's awesome about state legislatures is often they have much shorter sessions. You don't have to wait all year to pass a bill. Some places may have like a month session or a two month session. California's kind of all year round, but uh, you know, sometimes you can focus all of your activism down to just a couple of months and then work on your local, uh, your local city councils the rest of the year or work on Congress. They also have a smaller body they represent, um, typically. A senator will represent the entire state, but a state legislature may only have a population of like 100,000, and it'll, it makes it a lot easier to, uh, to get through. Um, sometimes if you get three, five, ten people calling, that's enough to boost a bill up in the legislature's mind. A um, lot easier to visit because they're closer, uh, easier to actually have a meeting directly with them. Um, and then state legislatures also, they cover a lot of things about your daily lives that Congress doesn't, that your city council doesn't. Uh, they can pass a lot of laws that you know affect everything that you do. Um, they also don't necessarily hear a lot from activists. Uh, you know, sometimes they just don't hear from anybody. And also, you know, what we found that whenever there's a new president, there is uh, inevitably a backlash from a state legislature. You know, in California, we have a very, very uh, anti-Trump legislature, which then results in them wanting to pass a lot of legislation that we wanted passed that they weren't necessarily interested in a year ago or two years ago. And now suddenly uh, we're able to get, you know, surveillance transparency near the finish line or we're able to get, you know, very various other things that we, you know, you know, privacy rules for, inter for the Internet and things like that. Um, to also give you an idea, it's not, you know, in terms of how many laws they pass and, and how they're on par with Congress. Congress passed 329 laws in 2016. California passed 898 laws in, in 2016. Um, you know, uh, I spelled Georgia wrong and I'll fix it when I, when I put it up. It was a, uh, you know, last minute data research. Uh, but Georgia did 307 and Florida did 269. Some of the victories that we've seen in the tech policy arena um, that have had a huge impact. Uh, Illinois passed the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which, you know, generally speaking, requires companies that are going to uh, use your biometric details or collect your biometric details. You know, your faces. You know, face recognition is probably the most common one. Uh, they have to get your permission. Um, one of the hugest things that we did in California uh, a couple of years ago was we passed something called the California Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or CalECPA, which requires law enforcement to get a warrant if they're going to access your devices or access your online accounts, which kind of makes California one of the strongest privacy laws in the country as far as you know, when police can search your devices. Something more recently is that you know we worked with the Virginia ACLU to pass restrictions on how police can use drones. They do need a warrant for drones for the most part, which is great. Um, something that I've been working on, you know, earlier this year is that you'll get, you know, a good a good example of of how you can do this sort of asymmetrical warfare with your legislature. And this sometimes works against us is that there was this weird dude who somehow got a bill introduced in something like a dozen states uh, that would require all internet connected devices to by default have a adult content filter on them and that to get the adult content filter removed you would have to pay like a forty dollar fee for every single one of your devices so if you had a cell phone and a computer and you know a, a laptop and a tablet you're paying you know you know 160 bucks to get access to the open internet um, and he somehow convinced like legislatures all over the country to do it just by contacting them, calling them, you know, putting together a, a nice website and draft legislation. Um, what we discovered is, and some reporters discovered is that um, this dude actually was a disbarred attorney with a criminal record for stalking who had sued. Uh, First, he had sued Facebook, uh, blaming them for his porn addiction, um, and then he also sued for the right to marry his computer. So, this 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 guy is you know a, a weird place to take legislation from, but he was able to do it. And then it was a real hard for us, even as a, an advocacy organization, to go state by state to uh, affect uh, to counteract the uh, the bills. Um, to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we're working on this year. Um, you may know that the FC, uh, that Congress uh, moved to uh, revoke the privacy rights for broadband that uh, the FCC had passed a couple years ago. Um, we've got a bill in California to restore those privacy rights, so uh, your ISP has to ask your permission before they collect your data. We've got a bill that would require every uh, police department to go to their city council 
to get permission before they acquire surveillance technology. They also have to you know, publish their policies online and give biennial reports on how much the, the devices were used, how often they were abused, uh, how much it cost. So it's kind of a, a fiscal responsibility measure and a, um, as well as a, a, a transparency and a privacy measure. Uh, we've got a bill that would require uh, juvenile detention, uh, sorry, juvenile detention authorities to provide uh, internet to kids for the purposes of uh, accessing education. We are close to having a bill that if your, uh, your uh, government body refuses to give you records inappropriately, they can be fined. Um, and then perhaps, perhaps some of the, um, the more prominent bills that have been getting a lot of attention are SB 54, which is the so-called Sanctuary States Bill, um, which has a lot of stuff that isn't relevant to, to EFF's work, but there is a line in there that cuts off uh, certain federal access to state databases, which we do find pretty important. Um, and then there's another one uh, to uh, ban state data from being used to create li religious registries. And the one bill, you know, this this has pretty been pretty pretty inter interesting year for us in that in previous years we've maybe had one positive bill or two positive bills that we've been you know, in supporting, but most of our work goes into killing bills. And it's a lot easier to kill a bill than it is to pass a bill. Like, killing bill, you find one thing wrong with it, you can convince people to vote no, uh, but if you want to pass a bill, you have to convince everybody that everything is right in the bill. Um, and so we had, you know, we'd have one or two before, I think we've got nine bills, positive bills, and we've killed almost every bill very early on that we were opposing. And so it's a huge workload for us. The one bill that we were working on that died was uh, to counter automated license plate readers, which are cameras that essentially collect your travel patterns by scanning your plate um, everywhere you go. Um, we had a, uh, uh, a bill that would allow you to cover your plate when you're parked, um, so you could not so much escape law enforcement use of, law of license plate readers, but these private debt collector companies and repo companies that basically drive around collecting everybody's data and then selling it to people. Fortunately, that died in committee. Um, some tips, you know, I, th I think uh, Scott had a, a more comprehensive look. You know, he, he pointed out using your legislature's website. Um, one resource that we use is a site called Legiscan, which tracks legislation in Congress, but in every state on the, in the country in a sort of uniform fashion. Uh, one of the things that we find if we're working in multiple jurisdictions is that using the individual website is just, you know, unfeasible because every website does it differently. Every website, you know, not, not every website lets you create an account to track bills and get alerts. So Legiscan kind of lets you do all of that. And one of the things we found interesting about Legiscan is that it allows for free user accounts. And so you can set up your own way to track bills. And then you can create groups so you can get other activists subscribing to the same group so you guys can comment on bills together, send messages to each other, and track legislation, you know, as a group. But if you ever want to know where a bill is, just call up the author and ask. That's, that's kind of the easiest thing. People like to look for things on the internet. Sometimes just the old fashioned way of calling um, helps. Um, and uh, we find that legislat legislators are pretty responsive. You know, they'll, they, they tally up the emails, they answer the phone. Um, some legislatures actually pu publish their cell phones and phone numbers on it. I was very surprised in working on defeating the Human Trafficking Prevention Act in South Carolina where it was introduced first is that I was able to like literally call the authors on their cell phones and just talk to them while they were driving in their car. And it was the trippiest thing because usually you have to talk to a staffer, but some of the, the smaller states, they don't have that many staffers or they're not expecting to get you know, swarmed with calls like you would in California. So they just publish their personal information, their home addresses, their place of business, all that sort of stuff online. Um, some legislatures are pretty good with social media, um, you know, that, and they'll be responsive on Twitter or they'll be responsive on Facebook. It's a good way if there's a last minute thing that you need to kill and you do know your legislator is active online, uh, to have everybody just hit him right then so that if they're looking at their phones on the floor, they see that uh, people are upset about something. Um, if you don't live in the state capitol, uh, keeping an eye, you know, subscribing to their mailing list and figuring out when they're going to have like a coffee morning or uh, an open house, like go to those. That is, you know, uh, a really easy way to just, you know, get your face in front of them and get them, uh, you know, the, your issue in their head. But taking trips to the state capitol to do a round of, of, you know, hitting like five, ten people at once in a day, that can also be pretty effective. Um, another good way to get your um, 
you know, thoughts into the record is, you know, watching for when they're in committee. And actually, you know, often these committees have a dedicated staffer who write up analyses and just contact them, tell them what you think, tell them what your argument with is, and more often than not, you'll find that it makes it into the, uh, the, the handout that's given to all the legislators. Um, and you can also call, call them as well. They often like to hear people talk to them. I'm usually very nice to them and tell them like, uh, you know, I don't necessarily know how this process works. Tell me how your job is. Tell me what you look at. What kind of things do you find persuasive? Um, people like to have questions asked to them, and uh, you know, and that is a good way to, to to get in their good graces and to get them thinking the way you want. Um, you know, as Scott uh, mentioned, we have something called the Electronic Frontier Alliance. Um, EFA, uh, sorry, EFF has, you know, starting to create this um, this network of local grassroots grassroots groups who can do activism on the local, state, and congressional level. Um, to join the EFA, basically the, the, the general guideline is if you've got three people, you've got a group. Uh, give yourselves a name and you know we can work with you. Um, and giving yourself a name actually really helps. Like saying I'm like Joe, Mary, and Tom, uh, and we support, oppose this bill or we support this bill is not necessarily as convincing as saying you know, I'm uh, Electronic Frontiers Toledo, or I'm Open Government Detroit, and then you know that can uh, sounds a lot better on the sheet and uh, you know with a handout, but also kind of allows you if you have a group, kind of allows you to kind of function as a lobbyist and talk to people who are outside of your constituent you know jurisdiction. Um, just sort of leave my contact details up there in case you have any questions uh, afterwards, or you want to get involved with the EFA. Uh, but yeah, we're always happy to hear from, from local people. Okay. Um, any uh, questions or discussion from the audience? Okay. And, and what can you please wait for the uh, microphone? Uh, it's because we're recording. Do I need to talk into it? I do. Yeah, That's just talking to the top part. Okay. Um, so is EFF as an organization drafting um, kind of blanket legislation that can be introduced to state houses nationally, or are you just tracking legislation and working to support and kill bills across the board? And then further, are you, tra are you looking at organizations like ALEC and SIX as they're introducing legislation and their policy agendas and utilizing that as a framework for what you're going to look to defeat or support? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, our state policy work has really only picked up in the last couple of years. We would get involved when somebody asked us to get involved someplace, and then we might help, and then there was occasionally something in California that we'd work on. But the last three years, we've been gearing up and doing more in California and doing more uh, around the country. But we're still a fairly small organization, so we don't, we're not like the ACLU that we have like a chapter in every state, and therefore they have like staff who can cover things in every state. So, you know, we're a little stretched with all the stuff going on around the country. Um, you know, a lot, I think most of the time we look for bills that have already been introduced or bills that um, if, if somebody has asked us to get involved, if there looks like there's a, a good chance of it passing, and we'll also triage it out in the sense that, um, uh, you know, is this something that is uh, that we can actually make a difference on? Um, if it's something that they just need another person to write a letter, you know, we can knock that out pretty quickly. But are we going to run an activism campaign on a bill that has like no chance? Probably not. Um, but we, uh, you know, generally, so we'll look for things that are out there, and then we'll suggest amendments, and we'll 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 work with the legislator. Uh, from time to time, we do uh, start early on the drafting. Um, you know, with the uh, the Cal ECPA bill, we were working with the ACLU and the California Newspapers Association to actually write the language with the authors. An interesting sort of side note: um, this was a bill where we had the most liberal San Francisco legislator. Um, you know, like uh, you know, he's like you know, gay, super progressive, all these things, and then his partner was about as far right as you could get. Um, like he's the type of guy who dry, you know, introduces anti-Sharia legislation and things like that. Um, but the two of them teamed up because you know, the libertarian wing and the progressive wing sometimes are able to bypass the moderates of both sides who are more um, institutional. But we did work on that and then the, um, the, the bill we have right now to restore internet privacy rights is something that we've been working on from scratch. But generally outside of California we don't start with the drafting stage. Um, we have dealt with ALEC before. They have a very strong model. Like you got to give them, even if you don't necessarily agree with their positions, you got to give them like you know props for being effective in what they do and getting bills introduced everywhere. 
Um, what, was, what is Alec? So Alec is the uh, I don't remember what it stands for off the top of my head. It's very it's very early. Yeah, it's the yeah it's the American Legislative Exchange something or other. Um, what's that? Council. Council. Yeah. Council. Um, so we've done work with them before um, because there, you know there's times where our um, our uh, 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 interests overlap. Um, you know, uh, you know something interesting that sort of developed in the last few years is like the Koch brothers have been super interested in criminal justice reform, um, which is just you know like I wasn't expecting that to happen, and so they'll often organize a lot of you know events and they'll start putting out legislation. And if you've got in California, if you've got a few Republicans on board, that's like half the battle right there. Um, so if you can start off with that kind of thing, then you have a lot better chance. Um, the ACLU, though, tends to do a lot more of the drafting legislation that can work across jurisdictions, and we often work with them to, to move that along. Hi. Um, so quick follow-up, um, which is just to um, reiterate on what she said about uh, six, the State Innovation Exchange, and I just hope that you guys can connect with them and work with them because they're sort of a, an ALEC modeled organization with a lot less resources that, that I think could probably use the expertise of the EFF on a lot of those issues. Um, but then my question is, um, what's your take on getting things done at the state level, um, you know, in, in state legislatures in, in uh, like a red state um, as opposed to in California, right? So you just mentioned like in California getting a few Republicans on is half the battle. How do you manage to get something done or kill bills in a state like like I'm from Florida, mm -hmm. where the legislature and the governor's mansion is all red? Yeah. Well, I mean, it sometimes depends what state you're in. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of red states are very fierce about their independence in the Constitution and their rights, and so you can surprisingly get a lot of Fourth Amendment type of legislation um, through them. They'll get a lot of interest, and they also, you know, you're getting you know younger lawmakers coming in who understand more about technology and they actually want to do something on this. And considering the, the small population of some of these states, it is actually a lot easier to get it through. But places like Florida are tough, you know, because it is such a big state and it is pretty red and they definitely have a lot of problems in government in general. Um, I would say that it's often hard to refute research um, and the uh, Florida's public records law is one of the strongest in the country, and so find if you're able to come to them having exposed the problem, and not just theoretically there's the problem, but like documentation. Here are like five instances where you know uh, Florida businesses have been impacted by you know bad legislation, or here are five instances where cops have you know used surveillance technology to you know stalk their ex-wives or to oppress like protester groups. Um, Finding and also finding an angle within the bill that speaks to the uh, the groups helps. Like in you know the things that we come across in California is that we're often up against law enforcement, and so one of my strategies is to try to split the police unions from the police brass. That there are things that uh, about a bill, so like Calicba, the requiring a warrant for things. Um, you know, we went to, you know, the police chiefs and the sheriffs opposed us, but we were able to get some of the unions on board because unions have a right to associate. They rely on the First Amendment right to associate. They could use more clear instructions in order to do their jobs better and not to get caught up in lawsuits themselves. Um, and, you know, it's just as they're all individuals and they don't want, you know, people searching, you know, I mean, they have personal information just like anybody else does and they don't want people searching their devices without without actual probable cause or, or a warrant and that was enough to convince them um, uh, and so you, if you if you're able to like look at a Republican and be like this is you know this is going to uh, affect businesses that can be a, a strong thing um, with the Human Trafficking Prevention Act you know we had you know 15 different arguments the one for us that, that makes us want to oppose it is that it's censorship and it's censoring the internet the argument that we went with with Republicans is that this is a tax increase. Like this is a consumer tax where every you know person's got to pay twenty bucks or forty bucks or sixty bucks for every device they own. Yeah, and 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 no one wants to be seen to be pro taxes, right? So you know if there's you know that that's something that could help with our surveillance transparency one. It's very important that agencies have to um, have to report how much things cost. Because you know these fiscal hawks. If you're saying this isn't just a privacy bill, this is a you know fiscal spending bill. This is to make sure that 
um, uh, local agencies aren't wasting money on snake oil surveillance technology that a vendor came in and told them it would solve all crime and it would be a happy utopia after there were surveillance cameras in everybody's home. Um, but you know, like you're like, this is a waste of money, and you can point to examples where it has been a waste of money, and that tends to work. Yeah. Well, I was going to say embarrassment can sometimes be a powerful motivator. Um, again, I want to discourage you know trying to embarrass one specific or particular legislator. I, I, I said in my talk, you know, uh, that that you don't necessarily want to resort to personal attacks, but when the entire legislature feels embarrassed. Um, then that can throw a, a lot of cold water on a bad bill. Uh, we had that, we actually had that happen with the bill, with the pseudonym uh, bill, the, the, the bill that would have outlawed pseudonyms on the internet. Um, I mean, basically, you know, the, the, you look at a, the language of the bill and it looks kind of technical and it may not be, it may not look very impressive at first, but once you start pointing this out and it gets out in the press a little bit, you know, they can start to feel the heat and feel the embarrassment. So. Uh, you know, coming up with the aspect that it's not so much singling out any person, but kind of makes the whole legislature look bad. Um, you know that that can that can really shift things, um, and, and, and it, so it does help to have uh, some context in the press to um, and, and to be able to to, to p just point out a particular aspect or put a particular spin on it. Uh, hi. Okay. I have kind of a two-part um, net neutrality question. Uh, first, I guess uh, how uh, how you can be uh, effective, uh, like, like the the current uh, FCC chairman is a former Verizon employee. So when when someone has a clear uh, agenda that they may or may not be lying about, and they clearly won't uh, be swayed by you know by people they already see as adversarial, how do you, how do you uh, how can you fight against that? And I guess the other part is, is once they sort of ignore your efforts and pass their net, you know, take down net neutrality, how do you uh, restore it after they're out? Okay, do you want to? I can try. Um, so I would, I would. <laughs> the first thing I would say is we have a whole panel on net neutrality coming up, mm -hmm. and that would probably be the first step to learning <laughs> what what you can do. Um, there's not necessarily a lot that state legislatures can do on net neutrality. I mean, there's maybe certain things. Um, it's very hard to go up against the telecom lobby. I mean, we are talking about an industry that is one of the largest in the world, and we all you know, are basically giving them money to lobby against us. Um, and they often have a monopoly on the system, so it's not like you even have a choice to go elsewhere. Um, the SDC stuff with net neutrality is really unfortunate. Um, you know, we are going to fight it, and it might actually be like a litigation that we have to go about to do it. Um, but you know, part of that whole process does involve getting people to file comments, and you know, that actually is important. You know, throughout the whole process. Um, you know, like in California, we have like a, a resolution about to to go through, in which the California legislature is is calling for uh, uh, the, main, the maintaining net neutrality. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, I don't know how effective that is, but it is like a nice thing you can do if you don't actually have a net neutrality bill. Um, we're seeing a lot of cities doing city broadband to, to go through it. Um, and so maybe, you know, looking at the, the local level on that is, you know, way to go. But I, 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 there's no good answers about the current makeup of the FCC. It's just is what it is. And, you know, we, we you know, Congress repealed the privacy rules, which was part of the whole package, you know. Um, Ultimately, what we might end up seeing is if they do repeal the net neutrality stuff, people will start noticing how terrible their internet is, and you know maybe they go and revisit it. Yeah, I want to say. Five thirty is the panel on net neutrality. Yeah, today. okay. Uh, I I want to say that yeah, net neutrality is is generally a federal issue, but in cases where the federal law falls down, if it if it did get repealed or shut off, then you could come in with state level legislation. But I need to say that. Uh, I think a lot of the problems with net neutrality would go away if we just had more choices uh, for broadband providers. And many, most people have, you know, one one telco choice and one cable company choice. They may not even have two choices. But a lot of times, it, it's rare to see more than two choices. And if we just had more competition, the problem is that on the state level, I know that it's true in Georgia uh, that the, the telco and and the the cable company lobbies got together and passed the law that has outlawed municipal broadband. So that reduces our choices right there. And if you can get in and kind of undo that. Now these are very powerful 
uh, lobbies, but at the same time, if you shine a lot of, you know, you, you shine a lot, there's a lot of passion around the, the network neutrality issue right now. If you shine enough sunlight on the issue, it's possible that you could get a bill in that would undo that. And, and uh, so, you know, my thought with broadband providers is why not have sort of niche markets, like, you know, why not have other providers that, that appeal to specialty markets? Um, like you know, like ethnic markets, like maybe uh, Hispanic or something like that. Um, you know, why not do that? Why not have resellers? Why not have a lot more choices out there? Um, and it's just, it's just really difficult because I think that the existing uh, providers don't don't always sell well to, to to all markets, and they certainly don't consider all uh, you know all aspects of the markets, but. Um, S certainly, if if things don't go well at the federal level, we can certainly come back in and revisit the issue on the state level. And I think California is a lot more progressive on this issue. And obviously, things are pretty backwards in in Georgia. I bet they're backwards in Florida too. I don't know the exact details of that, but um, you know, uh, so providing uh, direct guarantees at the state level of, uh, on a network neutrality basis might be a good thing, but another thing another thing to work for would be just simply more competition and that would solve a lot of the problems because if you feel like your ISP is data mining you, maybe, you know, maybe brand Y or brand Z isn't doing that. So or not doing that as much. Um, so that's another possibility. Does that help? Okay, next question. Yeah, so we've uh, talked about some, um, you know, national groups who sometimes come forward with policy like ALEC and a ACLU. I'm curious if, you know, 2017, all the big tech companies have governmental affairs groups. They've got lobbyists on retainer. They're increasingly taking public policy positions. Uh, I guess m more for Dave, I'm curious if you guys have been able to um, successfully find common ground to work with any big tech companies on, like, getting bills killed or promoted. Uh, yeah, in, in California, those um, companies take a lot of weight. They have a lot of name recognition. They're big drivers of the economy, and every legislator wants to be seen as pro-innovation. Um, with the California Electronic Communications Privacy Act, we had them, you know, I think we had scores on board. I think it was like a dozen or so uh, on board who'd signed letters and sent them, and that was really helpful. Um, with the bill that we have now, uh, to give uh, juvenile detainees access to computers. We were able to get Facebook on board with that, um, which was huge in terms of you know, raising the, uh, the profile of this bill and also getting a whole round of press because if Facebook does anything, there's you know, 40 uh, reporters who want to write about it. Um, they do have, they all have policy teams, they all have lobbyists. Um, if you're a local level activist, oftentimes you can go to your state legislator's website or your state ethics committee or secretary of state, whoever, whoever manages it, and actually look up the uh, lobbyists for these companies. And you can call them on the phone and just say like, hey, I want to ask you where your position is on this. I want to ask you what your thoughts are. Can I, you know, maybe pitch your company on supporting this bill? And they are actually fairly responsive. Um, I, obviously, I'm from a point of privilege because you know I call up and I say I'm from EFF, and they all know who we are. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of these places do have uh, local levels, um, and I think uh, uh, you know something that's really telling is if you go to the say the campaign finance site and put in some of these companies' names, you'll see that they do actually donate, and so there is clearly they're paying attention. I think in Texas, uh, Elon Musk was plugging money all over the place. Uh, I not sure what it was for. I think it was probably for one of his like high-speed things or you know, spaceships or you know whatever he, whatever he happened to you know need Texas for at the moment. But they are really responsive um, with uh, things like net neutrality or broadband. It's uh, broadband privacy. It's really good to contact your small ISPs who tend to be supportive of these things. Maybe get them to all sign a letter together. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's particularly good to find. Um, uh, tech companies that are in your area and start a good relationship with them. I, I have two things that I've been thinking about for a while on a kind of more general level that seem to me to be kind of the root of a lot of the bad legislation is how would you go about fighting to like have bills simplified like one bill one issue none of this thousand page stuff that people can bury stuff in 
Um, and the other thing is, has anybody tried seeing if you can find any state attorney generals who would actually go after some legislators and lobbyists under bribery laws? Okay, um, let's see. As far as the, the, the length and complexity of bills, it, early in the season, the bills tend to be very separable. And then as you get toward the end of the season, there's this, there's this sense of panic that sets in that you can't get your, your priorities through. So there tends to be, it, it tends to be a, a, a bit like a freight train and everybody's piling everything on a, on a boxcar in the train and it gets, you know, it gets bigger and more complicated. So a lot of times there's, there's um, deadline pressure or some other practical reason for, for some things to get glued together. Now sometimes there, there really is um, kind of a dilution factor going on with, you know, maybe somebody realizes that they're trying to pass a, a, a difficult measure um, and maybe they're trying to bury it in some, some things, in, in it's, it's some kind of large bill. But in general, um, there's very practical reasons for why bills get big and unwieldy and usually it has to do with the deadline pressure and trying to get something before the end of the session because these state legislators, they're not meeting all throughout the year. They have a defined calendar. They start in Georgia particularly, for, you know, for example, they start in January and they go till late March, early April. And if you don't get your, you know, they have a deadline called crossover day. And if you don't get your bill in by crossover day, it can't get into both the House and the Senate. So, um, so a lot of that stuff is deadline driven. And a lot of times if you sensitize yourself to the issue, it's very specific to the issue. And you can determine whether they're trying to pull a dirty trick on you um, or whether they're trying, or whether it's just a practical issue because they're trying to get it done before the deadline hits and there's so much other stuff going on. So the, the early part of the season, the early, early part of the session is usually pretty quiet and orderly and then it gets crazy toward the end. And you have to put yourself in their shoes a little bit sometimes to, to understand as the activist you know, you need to put yourself in the legislator's shoes sometimes to understand what's going on. Um, what was that second part of your question? Um, the second part was, has anybody like, tried approaching any of the state attorney generals or ever to like actually go after uh, lobbyists okay. and well, legislators under bribery Well, generally, um, so generally, if you're aware in the, in the U.S. Congress, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a broad, I don't know what the legal term it is, is for it, but there's a broad <coughs> immunity there's generally a broad immunity for what's being said and what's being done in Congress uh, so that Congress doesn't have to live in fear of, um, you know, of uh, what they say or what they do while they're acting, you know, as representatives of the people. But I guess you're saying in terms of bribery or things like that, if it's really over the line, um, I think you have to realize that, that they have um, a lot of latitude to, 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 to say what they're going to say and do what they're going to do. And you may not be able to get a state AG to come in on it because um, there are specific limitations on, on uh, actions that, you know, criminal actions that could be brought against them for, for basically doing their job. Um, and the real time to get them may be if, to go after them uh, you may need a different technique is what I'm trying to say. You may have to wait until a bill is passed or until the, the deliberations are concluded before you can really, it's, it's hard to do things proactively or it's hard to do things preemptively in that situation. And AGs consider their, don't necessarily consider their primary job to be, that's an elected position too, so I mean they don't, don't necessarily consider their primary job to be um, to, to be focused on the legislator, le legislature. Um, they may, uh, you know, they, they're really looking for things that are kind of outside there. But if a f really flagrant case is brought to them, maybe they'll have an angle where they can pursue something. But you have to realize that the legislators, in part because they make the laws, provide a, a kind of shield around their activities to a point. And it has to be really egregious. Before you can before you can do something like that, so the right thing to do is usually some amount of you know pour, you know putting sunshine on their activities, um, moral suasion, uh, public awareness. These sorts of things are usually more effective than than counting on the criminal system to come in and and, and regulate what the legislators are doing. Does that make any sense?
And I mean, I, I know that stinks, but they're, they're just kind of, they're kind of allowed to do that. That's not... And I'm saying that there's probably a lot, you know, 90% of the people in Georgia are probably not even aware, or more than that, 95%, are probably not aware that that law even exists. So I'm saying that you need a different technique. You need to, to put sunshine on that and make people aware of that. And that's going to bring about change. And you're probably not going to be able to go to the AG's office and say, well, there's this, you know, there's this sort of tit for tat going on. And, and, um, because that kind of stuff goes on all the time, and the legislators are writing the law, so they're going to shield themselves to a great extent, as much as they can, from that kind of activity. And there's just you just have to use a different technique, and you can't always count on the criminal, you know, the criminal justice system to come in and, and rescue people from that. The only, the only thing I would add is that it's not something EFF would really do because it's outside of our issue expertise area. Um, but uh, I would also say that um, if you've ever seen an a elected official prosecuted, um, the person, there's a good chance you know, they'll be out, out of office before it comes to a, a trial. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, prior to EFF, I've worked on, you know, judges doing things uh, that were on, you know, with campaign violations. Um, you know, in San Diego, there's a, there was a case I covered where um, a um, surveillance, con like a surveillance, a billionaire who worked on surveillance stuff donated, like, you know, half a million dollars illegally to a district attorney and to a, a mayor candidate. That conviction just came down like a few months ago, and that was like more than four years ago that it happened. And two election cycles have happened since then. And you know, maybe a legislator does something wrong. Maybe the AG goes after him. It's, they're going to pass a lot of bills before uh, anything happens to him. So just real fast, I feel like a lot of the people that tend to be involved with EFF and are in this room, we're all bleeding edge tech people. We know about things that are going on way advanced uh, than normal society, quote unquote. Yeah, I remember being involved with net neutrality almost a decade ago. So my question is, wh A, what do you guys see coming up in the next two, five, ten years, you know, across the legislation cycles, but also how do we get more proactive? How do we get the general public aware of things outside of the quote unquote nerd community, those of us that are plugged in and paying attention to these sorts of things, uh, so that we're not responsive and we're not being chasing our own tails? How can we be proactive? How can we get the communities around us involved? So I would say that making a good, I mean, if you're a technologist, starting a relationship with your legislator saying like, I am an expert that you can go to to explain these things to you. Um, and when there's bill sponsors volunteering to even testify in committee to be the person who sits down and gives, like, let me explain to you how the internet works. Let me explain to you how the internet of things work. I mean, you, you know, there are more and more legislators who understand these things, even in Congress, I think in the last like four years, I've, we've seen way more tech savvy and actually very like geek sci-fi interested legislators get elected. Um, but I think that, that yeah, it's, what's that? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that I think that you know being an educator to the legislator, and that's probably as important as convincing people in your community to get involved with it. Like just getting them to understand why this bill is problematic because they just didn't understand the technology involved. Um, next five, ten years, I mean, it's, I don't you know really want to predict you know two years out, <laughs> let alone five or ten years. Like you know brain chips and you know AR contact lenses. Uh, but I think in the short term, a lot of Internet of Things like legislation. Everyone, you know, hears about the hacking the baby monitors, you know, hacking cars, things like that. They want to do something about it, and you need to kind of get in there to make sure they don't do something bad about it because they don't know what they're doing. Autonomous vehicles is huge, like huge. Like I think I mean, we're kind of ahead of the curve in California because we've got so many manufacturers of that. But every state is going to have to pass something on autonomous vehicles. What and so we have a VR panel tomorrow night where we can talk a little bit about this. Uh, so VR, so I think AR is probably going to be the, the, the bigger policy hurdle because that's the one, you know, VR you're kind of self-constrained, whereas AR is going to be constantly, you know, scanning the environment in front of you um, and the types of applications that you can put into it, say like facial recognition where you recognize everyone around you, is going to raise way more concerns than VR. What I think might happen with VR is age restriction legislation maybe, like, oh, you have to be over 18 to use VR because somebody did a study showing that a 14-year-old got like a headache once. Um, or, uh, um, or um, like as soon as like, like legislators start like being made aware of VR porn or 
violent video games in VR, we're going to have the same like debates that we had to have in the 80s over video games and the 90s over video games. It's just going to be the same thing over again. Oh, this is too violent. This is too realistic. This is too obscene. And um, you know, that's kind of where we're going to run into to legislators trying to just react just for the sake of passing legislation. Yeah, and if you're feeling adventurous, consider starting an organization. I think uh, you know a group as small as three, like he's saying, is enough to get started. And uh, it may seem daunting at first. Uh, Meetup.com is your friend in this case. It does. It's not or not free. It's not that friendly, but um, but it can be helpful if you want to pull together. And I think you may find that there's a lot of people who a lot more people in technology who think like you do and wish they could do something and. You know, if you just say, well, you know, it doesn't have to be some, some uh, big, haughty thing. Let's just meet at a coffee shop and talk about it. And that might be enough to get started. Just do something simple. Just let's, let's meet and let's talk. One of the problems with IT people is that, you know, they're working maybe some, in some cases 50, 60 hours a week plus. Where are they going to find the time where they're working nights and weekends if they're doing shift work? That's, that's one of the challenges. But if you can punch through that and find a way, a, a time that, that works for everyone. I go to a lot of technology meetups here in Atlanta and people find the time to meet at 7 p.m. You know, on a weeknight. Uh, it's amazing how, there are a lot of people who don't make it, but it's, and this is a really big city too. People have to do a lot of driving. So um, we can, you can pull together 50, 60, 70, 80 people on a good topic. You shouldn't expect that for an activism topic on the first night. But if you can get something pulled together at a coffee shop, hey, let's three or four or five people meet at a coffee shop and talk about the issues. Let's talk about network neutrality. There's a lot of passion around it or whatever. Pick your issue and get the, get the conversation started. And then you can see, you know, can you leverage off of that to do some activism? Can you leverage off of that to just call the legislator and see, you know, how they feel? You know, wh what can we do about this? That's how it starts. And uh, you can always do stuff on your own, but it's a little bit better when you can get together with some people and do that. And again, I say, you know, get away, f away from the keyboard AFK and, and do that in person if you can. Meetup.com is great for that. And we're getting close on time. We got one more? It's 11. Yeah, it's 11. Did we, one did we have one more? Uh, just right quick. Um, as far as interfacing with uh, companies like Google and Facebook, I've seen a lot of censorship with Google, and I know Facebook and Google pretty much have a monopoly on a lot of the information we have. Um, is it really better to do more of an awareness campaign on that? Or like you were saying, they have uh, representatives that interface with the government probably at your local level. Is there a way to actually talk to the companies um, more than just like the feedback button on Facebook? It's really hard unless you're part of an organization, to tell you the truth. Like, um, I would say, though, if you convinced a legislator that this was an issue and you wanted to use their prominence to make a connection with the company, that can be really useful. I mean, they can use their bully pulpit and use their prominence to make those uh, meetings happen. I would be very, very cautious of, of talking to any, of having any legislator uh, introduce any bill remotely dealing with censorship, even if you're talking about uh, uh, what Google and Facebook might do because you just open that Pandora's box and we'll be tied up in First Amendment litigation for a decade. So, Okay. And I guess that's about it. That's, that's all we have for. If yeah. you have some questions, feel free to come up and talk to us. Yeah, and, and uh, EFF has a table over by the uh, escalators on this floor and feel free. We'll be there all weekend, so feel free to, um, to uh, come drop by if you have more questions or you want to get involved. Thanks.